Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I know we have folks all over the world. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, this is our first Guesty for Hosts virtual meetup of the year, and we have a very special guest to kick it off, Michael Elefante. He's going to be sharing key strategies he has learned in creating the successful Airbnb business that has led him to financial freedom. First, a few introductions. I'm Marcus. I'm the general manager of Guesty for Hosts. Today, joining me is Michael Elefante. He's an entrepreneur, a real estate investor, and a short-term rental industry educator and influencer. You might recognize him from TikTok, Instagram, or YouTube, where he educates his huge audience of over a million followers. And he educates them on how to make extra income by leveraging short-term rentals. His knowledge and experience in the short-term rental industry is invaluable, and we are thrilled that he is here to share his wisdom and insights with us today. So thank you, Michael, for being here. Uh, in today's virtual meetup, the agenda here is I'm going to kick things off. We'll look uh, over some data that's been published recently to give some insights into the industry. And then I'm going to introduce Michael to share his valuable insights. The format's going to be Q&A, as mentioned, so please submit those questions and we will get through as many of them as we can. So with that, I'm going to jump into a bit of data. So to start, for any of you who follow Michael on his social channels and know his backstory, you know, at 27, he turned to short-term rentals and left his nine to five job, was able to create a framework for passive income uh, and then financial freedom as a result. However, today, Michael will be one of the first people to tell you that things have changed and that achieving his dream requires a lot more than just posting a rental on Airbnb. Competition right now is steep. The supply has reached record numbers. Uh, we use Airbnb as our proxy here. And the latest data from a research company called AirDNA, as of September last year, there were almost 1.4 million listings here in the US and uh, over 6 million listings worldwide, both record numbers. So inventory continues to rise. And we, what we're looking at here is kind of the pace at which this inventory is entering the market. And so this is a, a cohort chart of all the inventory uh, global added on Airbnb. And what you can see for each of these colored lines is the year they were added to the Airbnb platform. So this was last year, this is 2021, 2020. And so if you look at September of last year, over half the inventory on Airbnb had joined in just the last three years. So we're seeing an influx of supply hit the market. Um, within the, the recent past here. That is projected to slow a little bit heading into next year with some concerns within the global economic environment, interest rates and other things. However, growth is still projected. Further, Airbnb of course is spurring this, this influx of supply. They've launched a program called uh, Airbnb setup on the heels of a campaign they were running called Airbnb it. Um, it's a program designed to attract more people to hosting by eliminating the friction and adding extra support for new hosts in particular. So there's programming to bring people onto the platform more easily. Um, they address things like risks and concerns and other obstacles that hosts feel prior to putting their inventory on the platform. And so this is a, another push coming from Airbnb to help drive that influx of supply. Uh, the CEO of Airbnb, Brian Chesky, uh, was recently interviewed on Yahoo Finance. And when he was looking into 2023, his quote was, I think this is going to be in some ways similar to 2008. A lot of people that weren't considering hosting are probably now considering it. So in spite of there being some headwind in the global economic environment. That's actually part of the reason that people joined Airbnb uh, in our last recession. Okay, so this chart has a lot of numbers, but the, the two things that are important to look at here are 
nights listed and the percent change over the past few years. So this is demand. I'm sorry, this is inventory. And then here, demand percent change over the last few years. So if you look at 2021, demand outseed, growth in demand outpaced uh, the growth in supply almost four times. If you look at the estimations on where we netted out in 2022, it's about the same. Now, if you look at the forecast for next year, we are anticipating that growth in supply will actually outpace growth in demand. And so again, this is an indication that competition is going to be increasing. We have faster inventory growth in the market than we have growth in demand in the market. All right, so in a few moments, Michael's going to discuss the tech and tips and strategies that he's used to stand out from the competition and maintain his high occupancy rates. However, first, I want to take a moment to share uh, what our program, our product, Guesty for Hosts, does in terms of tooling that enables hosts to up their game and attract more bookings. So for those of you who aren't users of the Guesty for Hosts platform yet, I know many are who are attending this webinar. Uh, Guesty for Hosts is a mobile first platform focused on automating your hosting operations. Uh, it's geared towards smaller managers. So typically we serve people in the one to three listing range. We also have a Guesty for Pros product at Guesty when you mature into um, a situation where you want a higher level of sophistication and the ability to go deeper. But Guesty for Hosts is for people looking to automate their operations, often as a side gig, um, to move forward in the short-term rental space. Everything is in one easy-to-use app, including channel management, cleaning management, automation of your messaging, uh, you have a website builder for a direct channel. So really the, the key features of uh, tooling within a property management software are here um, for you to, to automate your operation and guest for house. For those of you who are not on the platform, we do have an offer. Um, you can get $50 off your first month if you sign up using the code meetup50. Um, it's a free trial, no credit cards required. You can enter in the promo code when you start the trial. Um, it's a self-service product, so check it out. I think there are a lot of advantages for anyone who is either just using Airbnb or not using tooling at all at this point. All right, moving forward. There's no better host to show you how the right tools and strategies can help you invest, manage, and grow your rental business than Michael, our guest today. Uh, he's going to take the stand here to share some of his invaluable knowledge and tips and we're really lucky to have him here to share his wisdom. Uh, we did have a number of questions submitted ahead of time and some that are prepared that we can cover. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, and I see some people are doing already, please click that Q&A button to submit questions. And we'll do our best to wrangle those in the background and get them uh, discussed. All right. So first, Michael, welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right, so we have a number of questions here. And like I said, we'll go through some of these ones that we see in the Q&A. Uh, but to start, I was going to ask something kind of tactical. If you were to pick the top five factors in creating a standout invisible listing, what would those be and why? Uh, first and foremost, you have to do ample market research to understand why people are visiting that market, what they're visiting for, and um, what amenities or design are going to make people tick and be more likely to book your place and book at a higher rate. So the first thing is going to be design and amenities. Um, the second thing is going to be how you portray your listing, your design, and your amenities to people on the internet or on, on mobile. So that would be professional staging and professional photography and editing. That's like the most critical thing I've seen thousands of listings out there that are beautiful homes, great amenities, and the photos are awful and people are scrolling right past and not even clicking because it's just, it's not good marketing. They're not interested in learning more about the property. Um, number three, probably the first photo is going to be the biggest thing. So branching off of photography, because when you think about when you're scrolling through a listing or listings, you're, you know, think like Phoenix and Scott Slayer's owner, there's thousands of really awesome properties. If that mm -hmm. first photo doesn't catch your attention, you're not even going to click it. Right. So 
you have one photo and a title to earn a click, right? And if you guys are Airbnb users or Verbo users, like there's analytics to see how many impressions you had, how many people clicked your listing, like that stuff plays into how high you rank on search. If you're in, if people aren't clicking on your listing, they're going to get demoted in search ranking results, among other factors. So earning that first click actually leads me to the next point, which is your splash page, which is your top five moments of your property. So a lot of people make the mistake, especially legacy property management companies. The first five photos are all different angles of the front of the house. And that was like the worst thing you could ever do to yourself. Because if you have to scroll through 50 photos to learn that there's a hot tub and an awesome fire pit in the backyard, that should be in your top five. Like those are your top five key moments um, on the splash page. Um, and then the last thing, probably just, you know, having a title, if there's anything in your title or a name of the property that could be catchy, but if there's anything specific amenity wise that is in your property, that is not in the first or the first five photos, then you might want to mention that, um, in, in the title itself. So people can actually visibly read that before clicking on the listing before diving into more photos. So those would be about the top five, I think. Awesome. Um, okay. We're going to jump forward here because there's a fair amount of questions streaming in. Uh, if I look down here. Okay. So um, we had one live Q and a come in on this and then also a, a question from ahead of time on this, but is there a formula you use to calculate the potential ROI of a property? What are the characteristics that you look for? Yeah. I mean, the, the biggest thing I look at is cash on cash return. Uh, if I'm buying a property, which most of mine are buys, I'll look at total return on investment as well. For those that aren't aware, cash on cash return is basically judging um, the cash output of your business, so your cash flow, right? Revenue minus your mortgage or rent, if you're doing arbitrage and all your operating expenses, um, that's the healthier business. But instead of just cash flow, you want to look at cash on cash return. So that's the total forecasted annual cash flow or cash output divided by the total investment amount. So that could be down payment, staging, furniture, every cost associated with standing up that investment. That's going to help me judge whether, hey, is my money better off here or in the stock market or in another property uh, with short-term rentals? The beauty of them is the, the cash on cash return can be well north of 15, 20, 30% in many cases, um, depending on the option with arbitrage, it could be hundred, 300 plus percent. So that's the biggest thing I look at. I have a custom little template. I mean, it's nothing special to be honest, but it's just a, through a spreadsheet. Um, that you guys can build your own. I'm also just a sneak peek going to launch uh, a website soon where you can do all of that online and save your properties and build furniture, like a bunch of really cool stuff. So stay tuned there, but um, that's not publicly ready yet. But those are the biggest things I look at. Awesome. Um, again, a little more tactical here, uh, but we had a question come in around, would you recommend creating an LLC behind each unit? Or would you just do it under one umbrella? Yeah, it's really going to come down to personal assets and risk that you're willing to take one way or another. I know real estate investors that have tons of properties. They don't have any LLC structure. They're comfortable with just the insurance and umbrella policy. I know others that have bucket off every single property into a completely separate LLC. I personally have mine in an LLC series. So it's one overarching LLC. And then each property is I bucket off into their own a series, if you will. So similar, if not the same level of protection from my understanding, again, speak with an attorney if you guys really want to understand like what may be the best fit for you. But as your assets grow, it's probably advantageous to consider at least some form LLC structure. It's not going to do anything for you tax-wise, right? It's just more of a pass-through entity, but asset segmentation and protection. Um, but just as a FYI, if you guys are buying a property, doing a conventional loan, they're not going to, no lender is going to let you close in an LLC anyway. So you could always claim the deed over in the future. There's some caveats to that. Um, but if you're closing in a DSCR loan, a debt service coverage loan, then they may require you to actually close in an LLC. So it just depends on, on the situation. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, slightly related, then another question here. Um, if you're investing in a new property, what should be considered in weighing the options for financing? Um, their loans... You can mm -hmm. be using rental arbitrage. And so like your model may have an impact on your financing options. Yeah, I get it all for me, it always for all my clients too, it always comes down to, hey, how much, how much available capital do you have for this venture, either personally or if you're working with a family, friend, 
spouse, whatever, like what's the total amount of capital you have and what are your near-term goals like next 12 months? Is your goal financial freedom and, and create as much cash flow as possible? You're more than, and if you don't have a ton of uh, capital, you're probably going to want to entertain arbitrage or maybe buy one and do a couple arbitrage because you're able to scale faster. However, long-term, it's probably advantageous to buy property because you get major tax advantages through depreciation, cost segregation studies, um, things like that, uh, that can really knock out in many cases, all of your tax liability for the year on the cash flow, which is why real estate is such a special place to invest your money for loan mm-hmm. options. It really depends on, you know, I personally like to take on a, I guess you could see perceived risk, but I like to leverage a little bit more. The beauty of real estate is you can leverage, um, to buy a, a much more expensive asset than what you put down. And then you can reap hundred percent of the benefit on the capital appreciation. You have someone else paying off the mortgage for you. And if you're borrowing at a rate less than inflation, I mean, it's, in my opinion, it's almost like, you know, free free money in that point from that standpoint uh, for a cash flowing asset. But different types of loans: there's conventional loans, second home loan, ten percent down. If you have the intention to use it some for personal use, you're allowed to rent it out when you're not using it. Conventional investment loan, fifteen to twenty percent down. Um, keep in mind there is a conventional loan limit that varies by county, but you guys just Google conventional loan limit. You could see what it is for 2023. It changes each year. Um, and then beyond that, you could use more of a commercial uh, investment style loan, like a debt service coverage loan, where the lender is actually looking at the property's uh, forecasted revenue um, and ability to service the debt on a one-to-one or one-to-one point one ratio um, instead of your own debt to income ratio, right? To 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 cover it. So they'll lend you the money based on the asset instead. It sounds hyper local in terms of there's no no blanket answer here. Um all right. This also has probably a hyper hyper local answer, but uh, a question that's coming up is around how you price your units. Um, what type of information should a host be considering when determining their base price? And then, um, what do you do around, say, like special events or other mm-hmm. other things that may be unique to your area? For sure. Honestly, you should have a pretty keen understanding of what you're going to be priced at on weekends weekdays, different months of the year, different seasons before you even make a purchase on a property or, or acquire one. Uh, look at AirDNA historical data. You could look at pacing information in AirDNA to look at what the median price points are of booked and vacant properties are in the months to come. Um, once you have a property, and find comps too, of course, find two to five properties that are as close to yours as possible. Um, Location-wise, same amenities, You know, sleep the same number of people, same aesthetics that you're going for. Like, who do you honestly compete with? Pick apart their calendar on Airbnb or Verbo, see what they're charging, see how much they're booked up. That gives you a lot of confidence in your forecast. As far as actual pricing, definitely leverage from the get-go a dynamic pricing solution. Uh, Guesty for Host uh, connects with Beyond Pricing, Price Labs, and Wheelhouse. Personally, I've used um, Price Labs and I'm evaluating switching to Wheelhouse too. Wheelhouse is awesome. They have a great leader over there, Andrew Kitchell. Um, who's, who's a stud. Um, but both of those tools are amazing because you can, it'll help you choose a base price and it will dynamically change your pricing for you in the background. Um, and you can set a whole slew of customizations uh, from daily rates to pricing tweaks based on like a whole bunch of different criteria. So I won't go too in the weeds on it, but they also have a um, a neighborhood data tab in Price Labs and Wheelhouse has something similar. It's basically like forward looking information. And pricing trends to see like what percentile or you know for four bedroom properties are priced at what every single day for the next twelve months. That mm-hmm. helps. Like if you're not using those tools and data to your advantage, you're already losing because one, you're probably not getting enough for peak demand days, and you're also not getting booked because you're slightly overpriced for uh, days where there's less demand. And I've seen, especially in a city like Nashville, which I operate in, I've I see so many people that walk past twenty thousand dollars a year because they just don't know how to price. And it's, it's like kind of sad. They're happy because they're making good money, but they could be making an extra 20K. Mm-hmm. We have a large number of users in the Guesty for Us platform that have adopted pricing tools. So I think it's indicative of an educated audience within our platform. So totally agree. Um, cool. All right. So, okay, here's maybe more about tooling. Uh, if you have limited time, which I think a large segment of our audience does, especially for those for whom STRs are not yet their primary source of income. Um, what would you say are the most efficient and effective strategies? I guess let's start with marketing to market your listings. For sure. Honestly, start with just listing on the OTAs. Uh, Guesty Pro connects with all of them, which is amazing. Um, 
So do that as far as immediate exposure. You guys can work towards a direct booking strategy in the future. In my personal opinion, it's really not that necessary when you're first getting started. It's hard to, it takes a lot more effort to create an effective direct booking site and strategy if you only have one property, especially if it's in an urban area. If you have one in a vacation market, you're, you might be able to get repeat customers, offer them discounts. It's cheaper for the customer without the OTA fees, and you'll make more money on direct bookings. So long term, it's a great strategy. And we can get into some of that if you want, Marcus, in a little bit as far as like how to actually collect emails or email marketing and how to build tools. But yeah, for the for the most part, get your listing site set up and then definitely use property management software. I've used Guesty for Host for a long time. It's been amazing for me, um, especially if you want to self-manage before passing off to a property manager at some point in the future. I mean, last year alone, using Guesty for Host saved me like a quarter million dollars. So <laughs> I wouldn't bark at the tiny cost it is to use the platform uh, because I didn't have to pay a PM 30%, right? 25%. Um, it may make sense to do that in the future. And then price pricing, use a pricing so, uh, software, dynamic pricing, and then definitely use a uh, cleaning turnover software. There's a bunch of them out there, but turnover b and resort cleaning are the two main ones that I use here in the States. Um, and they're great. There's all those tools in the software stack allows you to operate more efficiently, make more money and save more time. Because at the end of the day, you don't want a second job, right? So you have to leverage software. Great answer. Uh, obviously, I'm on board with the concept of tooling, <laughs> helping a lot on that front. Uh, and to, maybe just to follow up quickly on the direct marketing channel topic, um, I'm totally with you. I do not promote the concept of someone just getting started in short-term rentals to try and stand up a direct channel where they think they're going to attract demand themselves. However, I don't think it takes very long before you can extract value from simply having a place you can send people to book directly with you. You don't know how long it's going to be before your friend sends you a lead and mm -hmm. you do not want to send them back to an OTA. The OTA yep. is a marketplace. So your person, your potential guest is going to get sent into an environment where they're just trying to sell that guest something. It's not your listing, it's something. Mm -hmm. And so risking that booking to me, I think is, is unnecessary. And you know, Guesty for Hosts and a lot of platforms have this concept of just standing up quickly uh, a place you can send people to book. And for, with Guesty for Hosts, it's like click, click, click. You have a, a website. If you're focused on demand generation, then things change. And I totally agree. Like spending money on pay per click campaigns or anything like that is not likely to have an ROI that's meaningful uh, unless you've got a very unique scenario for your one to two listings you're starting with in the market. Um, cool. All right. You kind of dove into a lot of the questions that have come in here already. We're, we're touching on things kind of at a high level as well. Um, here is a very specific question. Does Harding an Airbnb listing help increase exposure? I mean, sure. It's kind of, you know, even a lot of my own students or clients say, go hurt my listing. And I mean, it can't hurt. I think it helps like it's part of a small piece of the algorithm. But if you guys look at Airbnb or Verbo, I know Airbnb has at least some basic information on how their search ranking results work. If you look on their support articles, just Google it. Um, that's some helpful information, but so much more goes into it, right? How The quantity of uh, quality reviews that you have as a host, are you recommended to other guests by guests through the reviews? Um, analytics are everything for these sites. Ultimately, sites like Airbnb, they want guests to book as quickly as possible on their platform. They want to put what the hope they think the guest wants in front of them, kind of like a Google search without going too far back in the search ranking results, because the longer it takes them to find what they want in the price range they want with the amenities they need, um, they're likely to, to also have another tab open with Verbo or booking.com or Expedia or any of these other OTAs or even a hotel. So Ultimately, analytics is what it's all about. What's going to keep people on their site and what's going to make them more money? Um, so a lot goes into it, but you guys have to understand like pricing is important. Um, and just like a lot of other things play into the search ranking result, but it's not a, an immediate thing. It's like a more of a long-term thing. The better host you are long-term, quicker you are to respond to people, provide a better service, better hospitality, and ultimately drive more people to book and book more frequently as they get presented or you know have an impression with your, your link or page that's ultimately what's going to help you guys be successful long-term. That 
that dovetails with and covers, I think, a lot of the questions I'm seeing come in live here. A lot of it is around how do I increase my exposure on Airbnb? Mm -hmm. So I know one component of that is reviews. Um, And so I'm seeing some specific questions around what strategies do you employ to drive reviews in general, but then also ensure that they're five-star reviews? Yeah, great question. Um, and one other thing I forgot to mention, uh, Guest Superhost does have a little feature, it's the Airbnb rankings booster. Um, it helps kind of automate some of the management tweaks in the background, um, which ultimately will, I think Airbnb also part of their algorithm looks at how active you are as a manager, as a host. So like that will also help with your search ranking results as well. Um, short-term, long-term, which is great. Uh, for positive reviews, like number one is providing great hospitality, making sure your listing is clean. The biggest complaint you're ever going to have from a guest if they show up and something's not working or if it, if it's dirty and it's, it's tough because sometimes people exaggerate, they're a little unreasonable, but that's like the biggest thing. Um, and then just making sure their expectations are, are set and it's not something completely different than what they saw online. Um, and then the last thing is just honestly telling them that you left them a five-star review and politely asking for them to return the favor. And if they I think this is the easiest trick in the book saying, Hey, I left you a five-star review. We'd love to host you again. If you don't mind, reviews are really critical and important to my business. It would mean so much to me if you left me a five-star review. Also, if you felt like your stay wasn't on par with that, like, please let me know privately, like what was, what was wrong or what we can improve upon. You'd be surprised. Even if they leave a five-star review, they might leave like a long private note, like, Hey, this was wrong. This was bad. I didn't like this. And Um, it has saved our butt so many times. We've had well over 500 five-star reviews in the past three years. Um, And that ever since deploying that strategy has really helped. And you could turn on an auto review uh, through Guesty for Hosts, which is great for Airbnb, but you can always turn that off if you have a guest and you wanted to leave them an honest review and turn off the auto message too, telling them that you left them a five-star review. So long answer, but that's, that's like my main strategy. It's pretty simple and it works. Yep, makes sense. Uh, there's a few questions here too. I think it's difficult to capture something so broad, but uh, we touched on some, or you touched on some pretty specific strategies within a locale um, to when think considering where to, how and where to invest in real estate. There are some questions around people who are open to investing anywhere. And is there a different sort of approach they should start with in terms of just pinning down a geo for them to enter? Yeah, definitely start start your search local. But like 95% of my personal clients do not invest local because most people don't live in a, a decent market, right? For vacation rentals. So start local, um, then branch out to like, that just helps with market research. You know, in your state, where do people drive to, to for a quick vacation? right? That usually helps. So like there's multiple different types of markets you can invest in, but general market research, you could even type in like underrated parks that people visit to, or the most visited state parks, national parks. And you can kind of start from there. Uh, The different types of markets, urban metro markets, then you have uh, vacation markets, which can be kind of divided up into two other buckets too, like drive to vacation markets that like are the Smoky Mountain National Parks, right? Tons of people drive there from multiple states away or like the fly to destinations. That would be more like a higher end vacation or somewhere where you have to fly into. Um, but each of them comes with pros and cons, of course. But I would just start with basic market research on Google and then start to tap into the data on AirDNA and then just work on a basic investment analysis to see. You're going to notice trends like, hey, I evaluated 10 properties in this market versus this market. I'm seeing typically higher returns in market A versus B. That's not only like if the demand is good, but what's the price of real estate? You know, what's the price of rent if we're doing arbitrage? So a lot goes into it. Um, but for an urban market, just to give you some tips on what I look for, I want decent and growing tourism. So a reason people are visiting beyond just like, hey, it's a city that someone's getting married that I know here type of thing. Like Nashville is always comes to mind because it's a great music scene, great sporting town or sports town. Um, but also a growing population is important too, because that means the capital appreciation is going to be a little more sustainable if there's pressure on housing market supply. And also typically when there's more people moving to any place, any city or town, there's usually business also moving there, right? Because people are moving there because there's jobs to support it. There's Mm -hmm. other uh, capital investment from a business or commercial standpoint. And then people need temporary housing. There's hospitals, travel nurses, you could do midterm rental. So there's a lot of different other things you could consider. Uh, but that's like just kind of like high level what I typically start with basic market research wise. 
yeah keeping it high level uh and i think on the heels of the the data that was presented in the beginning of this session um there are some folks asking about sort of the future of strs in general i think we've there's been a a trend in social media around like airbnb bust over the last quarter or so i'll just start by saying there's still growth in demand so that's it's great for our category that we are seeing growth in both the supply and the demand segments. Um, it is a trend that supply was taking off faster than demand. I will interject that some data that came out just a few days ago was indicating that December outpaced December of 2021 by 20% on the demand side. So these will fluctuate. I feel that there's still a, like, a lot of upward mobility within this market. Your last answer indicates too, there are probably locales you can poke into where you see an even greater upside. Um, but the some of the pointed questions here to Michael specifically have been, are you going to continue to invest in short-term rentals in this market? Yeah. Well, I'm actually closing on a property in five days. So I haven't really posted much about it yet because we, we haven't closed. But um, I'm excited about that. It's going to be, it's like a 6,000 square foot house. And I don't know if I'll disclose the exact location. Cause every time I do that online, I get like a hundred people that start to invest there, create competition for myself, but I probably will. I'm usually pretty transparent, um, but it's getting more competitive a hundred percent. But it hasn't changed my strategy personally uh, or what I work with on my clients. Like you have to differentiate if you're in that top 10, 20, 30% of performing properties and operators, there's always going to be people traveling and there's always going to be demand for a short-term or vacation rental. So I think Airbnb especially is oversaturated with bad properties and bad operators. And that doesn't mean it's a not a great house or a condo. It's they don't take good photos. It's not furnished well. It's not marketed well. It's not priced right. And the hosts aren't good hosts. Um, so I think that's where it's going to be a key differentiator. And, and demand and supply have a way of evening out in any industry long-term. There's going to be peaks of not enough supply and then to meet the demand and then vice versa. So there might be some type of contraction in, in the supply. Um, and I think a lot of people overpaid just for the sake of getting into short-term rentals in 2021, 2022, uh, and they aren't making as much money as they were hoping because they only looked at the past like five to 12 months worth of data, which indicated that average daily rates were crazy. They didn't look at the three years prior, right? Or some future looking information. Um, so you can't base your forecast off of like the highest demand ever, which was 2021 when demand was nuts and there was a huge decrease in supply with COVID. So a lot of people dumped their properties. Now we're mm -hmm. seeing the reverse. So there's going to be some leveling out long-term, but I will say if you go above and beyond and create an awesome experience for people and are a good host, provide good hospitality, you're more than likely going to be very successful, but just be cognizant. It's like you said, Marcus, it's locale is important because each market is going to be different. It's not like Airbnb or short-term rentals are oversaturated in the world. It's each market is going to be very different on supply and demand. Yeah, it's an important caveat always. <laughs> um, okay, a few questions here around getting back to sticking out, uh, I guess, as a part of trying to be um, competitive in this influx of supply. A few questions around social media. I know your answer earlier was, if you're just getting started, OTAs. I totally agree. The highest ROI you're going to get is to go where people are looking. Um, but for others, maybe who have already done that, they've maxed out on the major OTAs. Is it worth investing in a social media strategy? Have you had success in a social media strategy and driving demand? Or are there other benefits of a social media strategy that's that still make it worthwhile? Yeah, and maybe I've shot myself in the foot a little bit, but it's funny. I have over a million followers between TikTok and Instagram, and I have never marketed my properties to get booked through those channels. I don't know why. I just like I everyone and their mother, the first thing they think of, and I still see this happen over and over again. I was I did it too when I first launched was. I'm going to launch a page on Instagram for my property. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, unless you are, have a really good growth strategy, like that is going to be a slow burn. The chances somebody finds your proper, like random property on Instagram is like, oh, I'm going to go stay here. I can't wait to book it is you might get a few bookings, but realistically, like people are going to go to Airbnb and Verbo to find a property. 
or if you have a direct booking site, they come and find you one way or another. Um, but as far as like a social media strategy, like not that it's irrelevant, it's, it shouldn't be top priority if you're first getting started, in my opinion. I'm with you. I, I equate it to the brand building that would come from say building out a direct channel where you're taking the next step to of you're doing individual demand generation. And that's just a whole different ball game than, you know, having a place to send people who have already found you. Mm -hmm. guests. Um, cool. There's kind of a trend in some of these questions of just like, what is the highest leverage thing I can do to take my business to the next level? So let's say hypothetically, I have two to three units, um, but I'm still not at that breaking point of like, this is now my, my primary income source. I am not on the passive income train just yet. Um, so I've checked the boxes, let's say with some, you know, being on the right OTAs, the basic OTAs, the basic tools, that kind of thing. What is the highest leverage thing? And maybe even in your own experience where you're like, oh, wow, I can, this is like a force multiplier now. Yeah. So I guess one is the current properties. How can you get more people interested in book, like learning more about them by clicking? And then how do you drive a higher book rate? Uh, the number one thing is going to be design. You can do a redesign. Can you add amenities? Are there other things that you can make it more attractive to people to be more competitive? Um, so you may have to invest a little money. Um, one of the companies that I'm a part owner in is Summerlet Designs. They'll do redesigns. They'll do ground up designs. They'll even go to the property and do it all for you. Everything they touch like turns to gold. They do in-depth market research. I've coached them previously on their own property. So they're great. Um, and then photography is another thing. If your photos aren't really good, just hire a new photographer and editor. Uh, and you'd be very surprised at what the same property, how good it can look in one scenario and uh, from a photographer and editor and how poorly it can look um, in another. So that's what I would do next. And then um, do maybe a readjust on your listing. If you have no idea how to do copy on your listing or maybe why it's not ranking higher, you could use a company called Rank Breeze and pay, pay for them to audit your listing, uh, see if they can help you rank higher. Um, and then the next thing is pricing. One, if you don't have a pricing strategy, you're already losing. Uh, so use dynamic pricing, use wheelhouse, price slabs, one of those tools. Um, and, uh, if you feel like you're getting booked a lot, but you're not making as much money as you had, you're probably not priced enough on certain days. However, if you feel like, Hey, I'm not getting booked. Like, don't be like, let your ego go. You're probably gonna have to price lower. Look at the neighborhood data tab. Look at what other people are priced at, especially for midweek days. Um, that'll help you get more bookings. It'll boost your revenue. And more importantly, it'll help boost your search ranking results. Cause your conversion will be higher. Those are like the three biggest things that you can do on your current properties, um, to, to take your cash flow up a notch. And I think that's a, a wonderful place to stop in terms of very practical advice in staying competitive in this market. So that's the general subject of our Q&A session here. So for those of you who are not already, you can follow Michael on his TikTok or his Instagram. He also runs a business, the BNB Investor Academy. Um, so uh, please reach out to him around that if you're interested. And then also... You can reach out to Guesty if you have any specific questions you weren't able to ask or get answered here in our meetup. And then a quick reminder, if you do want to sign up for uh, Guesty for Hosts and give it a shot, we have a promo here. Meetup50 is the promo code if you would like to uh, get $50 off your first month with Guesty for Hosts. So with that, I want to say a huge thank you to Michael. Uh, always a wealth of information. And uh, yeah, looking forward to our, our next get together. Yeah, appreciate you having me. Thanks everyone for joining.